Welcome, everybody. Hope everybody's had a good day. Uh, I'm going to talk about threat hunting and threat intel. Uh, just a bit about me. I didn't put an about slide. Uh, I've been at Casey's for a year and a half now and was hired on to pretty much formalize the SOC program. So we had a SEC engineering team, but we didn't have a, a security analyst side, an actual SOC. So I was hired in to come in and create the SOC and build it up. And so we got there in about a year, and then we hired on a second uh, senior SOC analyst on the team, so it's just the two of us. And we are essentially building off, um, you've seen, if you've seen some of the other talks today, the MITRE attack framework has been referenced. We actually, our director um, turned around and used that framework to pull out all the TTPs and the detective controls within MITRE and build that. So we, we've pretty much in the last six months formalized a lot of other pieces from just some basic detection and monitoring to uh, to getting actual monitoring going on and, and some centralized data logging and that type of thing. And I'll talk about a lot of that in the talk, but uh, this is more a passion of mine than anything else. It's, it's something we've, we've pursued to a certain limited extent at Casey so far. Uh, we're trying to get all the, those detective controls, like I mentioned, upgraded and, and good to go first. And so this has been more of my own passion, obsession, whatever you want to call it, uh, since I started doing doing the job originally and kind of a thing that I've, I've kept in my back pocket and on the back burner for for our program moving forward. So just a quick overview. Uh, Going to do some definitions and brief into on some concepts, uh, do a little breakdown about threat intelligence itself, uh, talk about some the fact that a huge part of this is quality over quantity uh, and dealing with IOCs and not actual usable data, uh, some threat hunting and some tools there. Uh, a little story time, I got a couple of fun examples. Uh, my main point of the entire talk, and this isn't to ruin anything, but a big part of it is context. We're missing context. It's 2018, we got a lot of vendors, a lot of tools, none of them work together. And especially on the threat intel side of things, you have a lot of feeds, which is tied back into the title of my talk, that feeds have data in them, and it's data. It's not intelligence in the first place, and even if it is intelligence, getting that integrated into your tools with some context and figuring out where the data is actually coming from. And, and you know, if you have a tool that happens to give something a threat ranking, asking the vendor to provide that information to give you some ideas about impossible in the, in the first place. Uh, I put the other piece in here because everybody hasn't heard artificial intelligence or machine learning enough in the last year. So I said, please uh, yell at me if I happen to say that. I, I am not planning to say either of those terms for the rest of the time after here. And then questions at the end. Uh, and if you went to Chad's talk at one o'clock on threat hunting, um, I'm gonna go into a little bit of that. His, a lot of his slides are the first few slides I have as well. Uh, this document right here is pretty much what I consider to be, if you're building a threat intel program, your threat intelligence Bible. It's by MWR Info Security. It's called Threat Intelligence, Collecting, Analyzing, and Evaluating. Uh, I did not put a link to this document in here, but I can provide it for you um, or send you a copy of it if you guys give me your contact information. But if you're building a threat intelligence program, everything that you will need and want to start with is in here. And uh, there's a huge bunch of references. So it's, it's one of the few white papers I've found that's actually got some usable information in it and is really well designed. I know um, talking in the SecDSM community, I'm, I'm part of SecDSM obviously, have been since the beginning. Um, there are other companies that are building up Threat Intel programs or have Threat Intel programs and they have been using this as their Bible as well. So. Uh, what the heck is threat intelligence? I did want to read just quickly out of here. I did not put it on the slide, but um, in the paper, they put as one description of threat intelligence is the process of moving topics from an unknown unknown to at least a known unknown by discovering the existence of a threat and then shifting those known unknowns to known knowns. So when the threat's then well understood and mitigated. So the idea is to take data and actually turn it into an intelligence. And that's actually one of the problems because a lot of the vendors out there are providing nothing but data and they're not actually providing intelligence behind that data that we can use. So uh, a huge part of threat intelligence also is before you reach out to the vendors, uh, you really have to remember that all the data you already have on hand, essentially all the programs that you have in your system that have a log, if you can get those into central man managed database, a centralized logging system, that is a huge amount of information about your own network. It's knowing your own network. It's you know being aware of everything that's there 
being smart about it and actually thinking through what you've already got before you go out to someone because just going out to a vendor and saying give me threat intelligence does absolutely no good as we know just like all the you know other discussions on attacks and things like that if you don't know your own network you're not going to have any clue what to do with this huge flood of information whether it's free open source flood feeds if it's the ET pro rule set if it's from a huge you know expensive vendor like threat connect that type of thing it's of no use to you unless you have some idea and essentially it's uh, that that outside part is this you know what someone else considers malicious in some way so it's something that someone's pulled out of malware it's all the IOCs that you can think of the problem is a lot of those are um, are very time based and quality based and it's a huge problem that's out there right now and uh, that's at my third bullet point that it has to be more than just data it's got to be where people come in you've got to be able to take that information in you got to be able to build it into your program and use it as an analyst that's us the humans behind the keyboard to actually turn that data into intelligence because most places are giving you nothing but the data and you know there's certain vendors out there that are doing more of the translation into intelligence but those are also extremely expensive so if you're getting started these are not things you can get easily you can get open source feeds that are free but the big vendors like uh, you know threat connect and, and some of these other big vendors that are doing also some of them that do like endpoint data response that'll provide threat feeds and pieces like that those are expensive programs and you have to be ready to ingest that data because you're talking about you know, anywhere from in the line of thousands to tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. I don't know what your budgets look like. I don't know how big your company is, but that's a huge amount of money to turn around and dedicate to something that, uh, you know, there's a lot of programs that don't even have what people like to refer to whatever is the basics involved already to dedicate a huge budget on your program to just threat data that you can't use is a major problem that people are facing at this point just because it's they're just getting spun up with these programs. And then threat hunting. Threat hunting is the other side of it. So it's essentially nothing really threat hunting is, but proactive in incident response. So if you have a system and your entire system and your entire program is built, the detective control side is built on alerts, uh, that's a good start. But if you're doing nothing but running those alerts, uh, as we all know, if you've done any of this, there's a huge amount of false positives inside any of alerting systems, no matter who the vendor is, whether it's a, you know, a, th a third party SIM or just a detective tool, an east west network monitoring tool, all of them have to be tuned and they've all got a lot of false positives built into them because a lot of times they would rather fail and have an analyst look at it because they don't view the analyst time as more important. And so you've got this, this disconnect between those two pieces. And so threat hunting is essentially if you have the alert pieces done and your, you know, your analyst is done for the day or they have some dedicated time, what they're essentially going to do for threat hunting is think up what it is that they want to go look for, whatever it happens to be, something, some program they're concerned about, some malware that's out there doing that research and then going and looking for it inside your own environment. So as I put the last bullet point on the slide, it's really about getting in the flow, thinking like an attacker, uh, engineering, Definitely doesn't get to do this, but even the analysts on your team, if you have a SOC, if you have a few analysts, or if you've got engineer analysts and people sharing time, it's really about getting into that flow and thinking like an attacker. As, as I put here, there's a horribly overused quote about the fact that defenders think in lists and attackers think in graphs. And there's a lot of good ways to fix that, but a huge part of that is to think about your network as a way that people would attack something. So take a specific point. Uh, one of my stories later is about uh, PowerShell and PowerShell monitoring. Uh, that's the whole idea of living off the land. Attackers are going to get into your systems and they're going to use the tools that are there because if they're logged, potentially they're not logged at all because they're just being used in the environment. If you're using it for software distribution and things like that, PowerShell is going to be out there and someone has to know what they're looking for. And then um, they're actually using those as attacks. So it's, it's more along those lines of just not doing check boxes, not just checking off alerts as they go on, but actually thinking about the entire network graph and how you would attack those things and kind of attack flows. And so, okay, we have defense in depth and we're gonna attack something a certain way. If we have a plan to stop that, what are the other three, four, eight, ten 10 different ways that someone could get in? All right, and, and this is somewhat of the review. Uh, Chad covered this a little earlier in his Threat Intel talk, if you saw that, as I said. Um, this is kind of the threat intelligence cycle that, that MWR uses in their paper. Uh, and the different stages are, the requirement stage is, is first, uh, you really want to define what you're looking for and what you want the program to tell you. So if you can't turn around, this is the idea of don't go out and pay an expensive vendor for threat intelligence. If you don't know what you're going to use it for in the first place, this is essentially this stage. 
So you've got to sit down and look at your own requirements. And truthfully, one of the best ways to do it is just narrow down and pick a subject to start with. So if it's the PowerShell side, if it's you want to look at file hashes and do you know file hash comparisons, that type of thing based on tools you have. Uh, it can also be technical or strategic. Uh, the technical side of things would be those IOCs, would be TTPs, would be pieces of, of actual technical data. And then the strategic view, as you'll see later, it's, it's kind of one of the subtypes of threat intelligence. The strategic view is more the type of things that you would provide to the board. So if you're looking to the board and the board's interested in risk, you're providing more risk-based reports. Uh, you know, the management level and all the way up to the board level isn't going to be interested in, you know, oh, hey, I found this awesome new piece of malware and this is great. Yay, they're not going to care. They're caring about risk to the company and, you know, losing losing huge piles of money if there's a risk and exposure, a, a data breach of, you know, if you if you process credit cards, that your credit card database gets popped, um, which is a major concern of ours. That is, you know, our, our holy grail as a retail organization is the fact that we process credit cards and have a credit card database. Um, but these requirements also need to be feasible. So they need to be something that when you provide an actual final product, the team can actually use this, not only your team to do the analysis, but provide out to the rest of the security team. If it's the engineering team looking at, at new projects they want to bring on, new tools, that type of thing, it actually has to be functional. Uh, the collection stage, uh, this is a huge part of the program. Uh, it ends up being a huge part of the cost, as I said actually getting it in, you can start with the free pieces, but if you really want other pieces of data and you can't get them, this can be a very expensive way to get them. Um, and this is pretty much the opposite side of the analysis side. Uh, a huge part of the focus needs to be on identifying the best information. So you need to, if you're getting feeds, you really don't want to rely on one feed on top of everything else. You really need to have enough data so you can do some comparison and some ranking internally and that type of thing and actually figure out what is reliable data and what is the desirable information for what you're looking for. So a lot of the feeds, a big problem with this is a lot of the feeds are generalized and it may not apply to any of the actual attackers or you know groups that may be attacking your company specifically. And then a huge part of this is also uh, the analysts themselves and those sharing groups. We're part of our CISC because we're a retail organization. Uh, they're uh, a huge group of people. Uh, you know, Target is one of the major members. They provide a ton of intelligence on a weekly basis. After, after their situation a couple years ago, they spun up a huge security team. And uh, they do a lot of contributing back to the community and a lot of providing that, that actual intelligence and you know, human analysis intelligence and not just, hey, we saw this fish and you guys might want to look for this email address or you know, this piece of malware involved. So. And then the analysis piece, uh, as I said, this is the other side from collection. It's usually the part that's using the rest of analyst time. Uh, you're going to collect the data and then you've got to review everything. So you can't get in 40 feeds from you know 40 different vendors and expect that one analyst is going to be able to look at them because it's a huge fire hose of information so you've got to figure out ways to narrow that down as well production is the reporting piece uh pretty simple it's just disseminating the information out to whoever the customers might be whether that's the other people on your team to say hey you know we want to do this inside we want a firewall rule that type of thing um, or to turn around and report up to the board those those risk pieces that type of thing and then the evaluation, this is really the back end side of it. As everybody does with projects, you just need to evaluate the actual output and whether anyone's getting any real value out of it, not only just your own analysts, but as I said, the engineering team and pieces like that. Quickly go over the threat intel types. Uh, this is also from the MWR paper. Uh, they pretty much break out subtypes of four different pieces of threat intel. Uh, the strategic piece, this is the part that goes to the board and the executives, those reports that are based on risk. Uh, current risk, and you want to look at future risk as well, uh, and then actual likelihood of these risks occurring. So it's super important if you're actually writing up some of these documents that you take into that future piece because that's really what they're looking for. And then scoping it down so that you've got an actionable definition. Uh, operational would be your actionable information on specific inbound attacks. So this wouldn't be... TTPs specifically uh, to uh, like an overall, but it would be tied to specific attacks and the likelihood of those things occurring in your company, um, potentially when and where uh, those requirements have to be focused on individual groups. And it's kind of, it should contain nature of the attack, any of the capabilities potentially. This is the type of thing where you're going to sit down and have a team meeting and say, okay, if you give a weekly report or a biweekly report to your security team, so the engineering team's aware, so management's aware and that type of thing, that 
here's the capabilities, the attackers, this is people that are attempting to focus on us, and not just a general, oh, well, let's talk about, in, in the retail um, realm, we deal a lot with Fin7, and uh, that's a focus of an attacker that we use, and not just something that's like, oh, it's Russian team, whatever, that's just, you know, hacking the internet for cryptocurrency, that type of thing. Uh, and then tactical, uh, these are the actual TTPs. So I didn't put the hierarchy graph on here, but uh, a big problem with IOCs itself and the IOC data is the fact that they're very, very tied to time. And so if you have a hash, of course, if someone recompiles the code and changes one bit in the piece of code, they change one line, one letter, you're gonna get a different file hash. So file hashes are almost completely useless depending upon your tools. Uh, they're good for application whitelisting inside your company, which I, which I talk about later. But file hashes themselves are extremely, extremely you know, tied to variability, as well as IO, a lot of IOCs, the vast majority of them are IP addresses, and those are only tied to you know, threat actors through whatever someone decided was inside a piece of malware or inside some piece of, uh, piece of code that was examined. And then these are, once again, groups that likely attack you. And then the technical side, this is what a lot of us are gonna be doing. This is the actual data. This is the IOCs, this is the command and control channels, this is the attacker infrastructure. Uh, this is different from tactical because it's specific information and once again, here is the, the exact timeliness of those pieces of data that you've got this super timeliness tied to everything. It's, it's not, you know, an IP address, especially with like a, a IP address or URL that's tied to a domain generated algorithm URL is possibly maybe going to be up for three or four hours. And that's not gonna be any good if you get a threat intel report for free two and a half weeks later when the site's been restored or it's been taken down already. And then when you're looking at requirements, you wanna look at current and uh, historical as well if you possibly can across your network. So a few observations on threat intel. Uh, definitely the biggest point here is quality over quantity every time. If you can figure out a source that's actually giving you quality information like our sys does for us, that quality of information is so much more useful than ha just having this huge fire hose from 20 different feeds. Um, and my second bullet point there, it's mostly useful, useful, or I meant to say less than useful data, excuse me, um, that a lot of these are coming from. You've got a huge amount of information, a very small amount that actually applies to you, and figuring that out is a huge, huge amount of work. And uh, another problem is a lot of the current platforms, um, we have exposures to some um, commercial threat intel providing vendors, and there's huge problems with their platforms. Uh, once again, we're in 2018, we should be a little better at this point, but a lot of the vendors are just providing these feeds or they're providing, um, we use Splunk for our logging and we've got you know, a centralized logging through Splunk. And they've got dashboards that you can build up for Splunk. It's an app that's installed in Splunk. The, the dashboard itself is either useless, it's, it's running a huge amount of processing power because it's trying to process this giant hose of IOCs back on all your historical data and causes a lot of problems there. So at the point we're at right now, from what I've seen, a huge amount of them are a problem in the vendor space. Uh, this is also another big one um, from, the, from the commercial entities and the, and the open source one we've seen. Very few, if any, are aging out data. So once again, if you've got Threat Intel data and it's two weeks old, is it really useful? Is an IP address really useful? Uh, on top of the fact that a huge part of it's tied to the web and their ad networks and things like that that you're getting IP addresses on. So just farming through it all is a horrible problem. Um, in one specific tool that I've seen, you could mark things as false positives. There was no way to take that back. So if you mark something as a false positive and then turn around and need to use you know, that you find out from a different source that this is an actual problem, you have to then contact the vendor to turn around and change it on their database back end to get it to function. And a huge amount of these vendors are just getting started. And as I've said, they could be considered at best maybe a fancy threat feed of anything else. There, there's very few vendors that are going into the depth that they need to, to get actionable data to you that actually applies to your, your specific area of business, let alone your specific company, your specific network, that type of thing. They're just, there's no communication there where even a lot of them are reaching out saying these are the things we can do for you. How are you set up? What would the benefit be? That type of thing. So this is the joke. You should all have known it was coming. We had to have a little crack fix joke. So <laughs> this is the inspiration for my title. Uh, I feel many of the vendors are seeing us as nothing more than someone looking for their next fix of data. So they're slinging IOCs out there. We're getting IOCs. It's a huge flood. 
but there's no thought to any threat intelligence and uh, in actual usable data out there for us specifically in each of our companies. And then I want to talk about threat hunting as well. Uh, this pretty much sums up a very good part of, of threat hunting and attackers out there and people. Uh, people are, you know, that the whole adage, the old adage of people are the weakest link only in the fact, and I think the, the Facebook trial the last week or so, or not trial, but the Facebook, you know, interrogation stuff that's been going on is tied to that, that, you know, you've got this people and knowledge and, and awareness type of issue that, that you can have where people aren't aware of how systems work, and so they feel that they're either way more secure or way less secure, and so they'll just do whatever they want because that's what they want to do. So this is the fun part. The threat hunting part's the fun part. So you've got all the data. You want to turn it into intelligence. Right here, simple and easy, just pick something. Just pick PowerShell to look at, pick uh, a piece of malware to look at, go out and do some research on it, figure out what the IOCs and TTPs are tied into that, and just go look for it in your environment. What tools you have, use the tools you have in your own environment, whether you've got you know, a network monitoring tool, whether you've got uh, endpoint detection or response, where you've got an application whitelisting system that's turning around and pulling up hashes and, and programs and alerts for band pieces and that type of thing. Uh, we refer to it essentially as our daily checks. We go through a whole list of all our tools. We've, we've coordinated a lot of it down into the one pane of glass in, in Splunk and built up a lot of dashboards that way, but there's still vendor tools out there that aren't available to do that. And so we go through every day and do those analysis checks and, and see what's out there. And then we turn around and take it to the next step and say, what are the things we're seeing? What aren't we seeing? What do we think we're not seeing? What do we want to test? That type of thing. So, so as the joke is, you know, we can't live by alerts alone. And, and this is our chance to be bad guys. So I want to go over a few tools real quick. Uh, as I said earlier, every piece of software you already have has logs inside of it. Uh, you should use those first. Uh, get centralized logging if you don't have it. It's a massive, massive boon to being able to look for stuff in the first place. Um, you need to get into this log management system, get it usable, get it to the point where your analysts can turn around and search data in there. And like Splunk is a good example. It's, it's a paid for product, but it actually does data analysis and then you can do queries against it. And it's a huge benefit for being able to see what's inside your own network and use some of this as 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 a function of, of the job itself. And uh, you know, you've got threat hunting and threat intelligence data. You can define your hunt from those. You can decide, okay, well, we've had a larger phishing campaign this week, that type of thing. So just a few tools real quick in case you're not aware of them. This is as I use for analysis and for threat hunting and that type of thing, uh, just to talk about them real quick. So there's URL scanners out there. Uh, the two best ones I've found are URL query, which is the example here. And then urlscan.io, there's a whole bunch of them as well. These are cloud URL scanners. Um, URL query, if I remember correctly, does not give this option, but URL scan does. Um, if you go under, you see the button that says go is a public scan. Uh, that will actually list anything, any website you put up here. So if it's, if it's you know, from an internal phishing message and it may have company information in it, just like you know, some of the scanners I'm going to talk about later, if you go underneath options, you can choose it to be a, a private scan and so your data won't be out there. Uh, a lot of these and the next, the next piece I'm talking about, virus total, is probably, quote, unquote, the worst. They're a vendor out there. There is no way to turn around and specify if you put a document in that it's not public data. That's kind of how they trade. That's how they make their money. Um, unfortunately, if you turn around and take a company document, you know, like an Excel file, they got marked somehow as malicious and you upload it and it's got company personal data information in it, you're in trouble because there's no way to get it back. This is a database. You can sign up for a pro plan if you're not aware. There are plenty of talks out there from a ton of different security conferences about guys who's given entire talks on going in with their pro account to virus total and pulling out company information. And we mean database creds and pure in, in plain text, um, financial information, everything is out there. So virus total is kind of a backup that I would use if it's something that came in as like a potential fish from an outside source. And then hybrid analysis, I think is a way better program. They've actually just updated and added some more scanning functionality into it. Uh, there's actually a way in here as well to specify not scanning it as far as a public piece. And then for URL details, you've got uh, a whole bunch of companies out there. This is essentially advanced who is. So if you're looking at URLs, you're looking at IP addresses, you're looking at you know, co-hosting, that type of thing, you can get that from the, the URL and IP scanners. And then DNS dumpster is really cool. If you guys haven't ever seen this one, go out and throw your uh, company domain in there 
and take a good look at it. It's actually rather eye-opening. They, they will pull down all the public information. You'll get to see your entire network. If, uh, if you're not already aware of it, it'll, it can scare people. And then Census is a, a pretty new one to me. I don't know how long this has been out there. Uh, you actually need to sign up for an account. You get a free couple free queries, but if you sign up for a free account, they'll let you turn around, do a scan, and it's pretty much like these other ones you can put in. You can put in domains and IPs, and they'll give you all the infrastructure that they can see tied to those different places. Uh, here are a couple. I've got um, two of them, two big ones that I found that there's a whole bunch of useful information in. Uh, Alien Vault is a, uh, a pretty much a SIM company out there. Uh, they do a lot with the community, and then they've got their own commercial product as well. But this, uh, th their open source Threat Intel platform is completely free. Uh, you sign up. You can essentially sign up to follow other people that, that provide information, and you're by default signed up for their general feed, and they will actually email you, and I get probably anywhere from 5 to 15 emails a day based on threat information and, and threat actors and malware and pieces like that that they will actually email you about so that you can go out and take a look and then they've got this entire platform that you can post your own information and that type of thing in. And then IBM actually has one as well. Uh, IBM has the X-Force Exchange. If you haven't heard of that before, they are an open source threat intel program. Uh, they'll pull in a whole bunch of information and, and help you look at data as well. Uh, you can go hunting in these environments or, or you can get notifications and, and just go out and look and see what's, what's top of the pile for the day. And then this is a huge one. Um, if you're not aware, uh, Bloodhound is a reasonably new tool. Uh, it's run by, it was created by a few of the guys that were at a couple other companies and they formed Specter Ops. They're a pen testing company. They're pretty new in the last year. This tool actually is Active Directory Discovery. So you can install this. Uh, pen testers are using this at a very high rate. So if you've had a pen test lately and they haven't used Bloodhound, I would ask them why. It essentially requires no creds, essentially just domain user, no domain admin, anything like that, because that's the whole point is to get domain admin a lot of times in a pen test. It's, a, it's an amazing program that just uses the features built into Active Directory. If you weren't aware, Microsoft designed Active Directory to be very helpful. So it leaches out a ton of data. This tool is essentially a whole bunch of PowerShell commands and a, a lot of .NET and pieces like that that are tied into Windows. It'll go through Active Directory and query Active Directory for everything. You can use it for um, it, pen testers are using it essentially to map your entire AD network. Uh, if you run this on your work network, it will scare you. And a huge part of it is that it will show you connections between accounts. This will actually connect and you can look at anybody in AD from one side to the other. So if you want to see the best route between your account and domain admin, hopefully you're not just using your own account as DA. Um, <laughs> it's your call, but I wouldn't do it. Um, <laughs> it will show you any user. So if a pen tester comes in, if they can get a machine, say it's, you know, you're, you're not doing a full black box test, you're doing a white box test and bringing them into the environment and you're giving them a machine, you can give them a pure machine that just happens to be on the domain. They can run this tool with no required up graded creds, map out the entire network, and then figure out from whatever their, their fake account, you just made, you know, Joe Bob brand new employee in the marketing team, they can figure out what level they need to go through between group access as well as machines. So it will show that if you just run a query, and I should have brought one up and put a slide up here, you can just look at, you know, Joe Bob and marketing is in these groups and these 10 groups, and these have rights on these machines, and then this, you know, then you can get to the help desk guy, and it will build shortest path, it will build all path and everything. So if you haven't used it, it's, it's, it's actually really eye-opening and scary. But it will map out pretty much essentially what they need to do to get from any one person to another machine anywhere in your environment uh, in the domain itself. And if I'm not mistaken, it'll map across domains if there's any domain connectivity. So if you have a, you know, lockdown domain, but it's got some connectivity for accounts or you've got a jump server, that type of thing, it will map all those out as well. So it's a heck of a tool. And it's a, it's a good thing as a defender to look at the, the top end attack tools and see what you can actually see. And then this is one, uh, a huge program out there. This is free open source. It's Security Onion. If you're not aware of Security Onion, it's essentially a SIM. It's an open source SIM. Uh, this, they've just recently upgraded to using an ELK stack. So you've got the full ELK stack, Kibana database type of thing. Uh, a big, huge part of Security Onion is if you're not, it's not easily designed to put into a large scale production but it's a good way to install on a box and do a POC in your network. Uh, a big part of that is Bro. 
And if you're not aware, Bro is not really network monitoring, but it, it's network data. There's a huge amount of information in there. And if you're not aware of Bro, I would go take a look at, at Bro and what you've got. Um, and this is just, you know, you can put this out as a POC in your environment, put it out there, give it a tap off your network and just see what kind of information you can pull. Uh, Bro's search queries are amazing and super in depth and, and you can become a Bro ninja and really, really see what your, what your uh, environment's like. So story time, first off, does anyone recognize any of those three IP addresses? Any of them? Anyone know what the first one is? Google DNS. The second one? Yeah, loop back address on Windows. The third one, I think I, think I mistyped this one. I think it actually came in as um, 31337. So instead of elite, it came in as elite. Uh, what do these have to do with IP addresses? They sure look like IP addresses, don't they? Uh, that would be great. And uh, if you had it, it would, it would be great if they were IP addresses. And it would be awesome if this was plugged into, you know, like your Thread Intel tool is plugged right directly into your firewall. And so when Thread Intel comes across with negative IPs, it's just gonna put a firewall block on them, right? Is that gonna cause a problem potentially with Google or any other IP address? It say instead of 8.8.8.8, .8 .8 it was, you know, to your main cloud server and your Amazon cloud, your Azure cloud, that type of thing. A lot of these Thread Intel programs try and say that they can pull this data down and they're gonna turn around and you can feed them into your, your Palo Alto firewall. It's got Thread Intel pieces built in. It'll block things for you. Every single one of these is because the Thread Intel tool I was looking at turned around and started using that hybrid analysis tool and their public data that they were providing. It decided these were IP addresses. They're actually version numbers. So 8888 was uh, I'm trying to remember which that one was. Uh, the 127 one was Adobe. It was a recent Adobe upgrade. And the other one was tied to another piece of software. So the thread into the intelligence built in, the intelligence built into the Thread Intel tool, decided those are IP addresses. And had we had this tied in directly to our monitoring and, and firewall blocking system, it would have actually, you know, broken something or a whole lot of somethings if these were a lot, you know, scarier addresses than these basic ones. And it was just kind of a hilarious to see these actually qualified that way. And then a huge part, uh, story-wise, is the defense in depth. So you've got all this, uh, all these IOCs and that type of thing. If you don't have defense in depth in your network and things are making it through, you're in trouble anyway. A huge part of this is um, you know, we've got an app whitelisting program. We've got a tool that does it. It pulls file hashes. Um, we had some pen testers come in a couple months ago, and one of the huge problems they had was turning around and actually getting a program to run. So unless it's a whitelisted program in the first place, you can't get it to get it to function. So any of their any of their custom made tools, that type of thing, are not going to run on your network period if you've got a whitelisting tool in place. So that's a huge benefit. Uh, deception tools out there. A couple other guys today have talked about uh, some deception tools. You've got uh, honeypot tools, honey token tools. Uh, places like uh, Symmetry, if you haven't heard of them, their Maze Runner tool is a huge deception tool. Uh, Canary has uh, a honeypot tool that's essentially a plug and play box you put on your network that runs honey tokens. Uh, there's actually another company, and I can't remember the name of them, that actually does essentially honeypots and honey tokens inside of Active Directory. So if your Active Directory environment has you know 10,000 objects in it, the tool will actually make it appear that there's a million or five million, and then the attacker, when they turn around and you know iterate through that, ends up seeing that you've got you know 1,800 domain controllers and 50,000 people, and the vast majority of those are fake, and they have to figure out a way to you know move through all that data because the more that you're pouring at the attacker for them to see in those cases is better, and then of course network monitoring. So hopefully everybody has a sim, some type of network monitoring tool, that type of thing, and then. Um, the last one is you've got to look at threat hunting with threat intelligence is to prove out the bad while you're looking for hunting. So you've got, um, you've got essentially this idea of, of tying the tools together and not just as your initial inspiration, but actually some functionality as well. And then, uh, like I said, we use uh, Splunk for our one pane glass. It's possible. It's a really good tool of some sort. If you don't have a Splunk or you can't do that, there's open source options out there. You need to pick a good monitoring, a centralized platform, throw everything at it so you can at least see what's going on in your network from the analyst side. And my last story is just research I've been doing in the last couple of weeks. Uh, we've been looking at PowerShell and PowerShell logging. And it's a great tool and it's built into Windows and it's wonderful. And there's uh, with PowerShell 5 essentially, 
Uh, if you can get off of PowerShell 2, 3, and 4, especially 2, because there's downgrade attacks with PowerShell 2, because there's no logging and pieces tied into that. But if you can get on to, if you can get your systems upgraded and get to PowerShell 5, it's wonderful. Uh, they have a couple good options built into PowerShell 5 for logging itself. Uh, script block logging is a huge one. Uh, it actually logs all the scripts. Uh, Windows is good at, even if it's in malware, most most you know malware authors are going to obfuscate your code and script block logging will actually take that as it's translated back to powershell itself and give you the outputted script so we did a whole bunch of testing with uh, my sock engineer in the last week or two we've tried a thousand different ways and all the logging comes up and then there's transcription logging which essentially if you launch a powershell window or powershell launches um, transcription logging is essentially everything that's typing into the window so if someone types something and erases it those are all great. Uh, a huge problem that we just found, and it's documented out there, this isn't something massive I've discovered, uh, but in doing a lot of research, we actually found out that uh, PowerShell rights and those logging rights are set in Windows by group policy object. Sounds like a wonderful idea, except to stop a problem with having to look at the group policy object rights every time PowerShell is run, PowerShell caches that information. There is a way to overwrite the cache to turn off script block logging at this time. So <laughs> you've got all these wonderful logging tools and then you're, it's falling down. And this is just a good recent example that was literally happened this week that we're looking at. I do not have an answer to it. I do not have a final solution yet. It's literally how Windows is built in with group policy object. And these are the type of things that if you're not doing threat hunting and you're not looking at threat intelligence and things like that, you're not gonna know these things aren't there. You're gonna think you could turn these things on that's just the way it is, great, now we have logs. If you're not digging into them to the point of looking at the way an attacker looks at these things, you're gonna, you're gonna lose out because suddenly someone runs a piece of malware and believe me, all the malware guys are aware of it, they're gonna write their tools with this as the first script and so you're lucky if you can catch the first script and then you've essentially got a persistent run as rights of the person so if they can get it to run as, as system you then essentially have a system root shell in a windows box that's persistent just sitting out there with absolutely no logging and everything you run after that is is gone there's no logs for it whatsoever so that's a that's a scary recent discovery so like i said my main point in all of this is that context is king you've got the current state out there outside of very few vendors period uh, whether they're expensive or not. They're just giving out IOCs. You've got no correlation whatsoever. Uh, context in the analysis of them, uh, to actually understand the data sources and get some idea of where this is all coming from, is completely missing in the vast, vast majority of it all. And I really think that uh, if a vendor comes along or an open source project gets started, they can get us the ability to, you know, we've kind of gotten this idea of one pane of glass in the sock and for defense, but we don't really have some of this threat data and threat intelligence turned into something where we can really get context, where we can really look at, at the data and where it's coming from and figure out whether it's, it's actually something we're concerned of because your company might be concerned at, you know, a 90% level because this is a piece of malware where I know I've got between my defense and depth tools a way to stop that already that I've tested that's not going to function like that application whitelisting tool. If I have that and you don't, you might be way more concerned that a piece of malware makes it through in a fish and someone's going to run it and it's just going to run where I've tested my app whitelisting tool and it's going to block that. So my concern might be at a 10% or a 20% of that actually occurring in case it happens to work for some reason and yours might be at 90 or 100%. There's really nothing I've seen out there. Now, I have not seen every tool. I've not seen every, you know, vendor tool out there. I haven't seen all their all their platforms and that type of thing. But at this point from doing this and researching it, I haven't seen anywhere that's really providing us this type of context. And that's it for me. Anybody have any questions? Have you found any threat intelligence schemes that are instead of like IT where I'll have things that are behavior based, so like PowerShell behavior in a certain manner yep. that would be considered compromised? So a behavior based threat intel tool. None that I've seen so far. Uh, once again, like I said, there are the big vendors. Uh, Threat Connect's a big one out there, and the reason I know them, we've kind of looked at their program. Those big expensive vendors are actually turning around and doing a lot of this intelligence pieces, so they're providing a lot of that for you, but their programs to buy into them are also, they're, they're looking at, you know, Fortune 50, Fortune 100 maybe companies. So those, just to get into those programs is huge. They're doing that, they're ripping apart malware. So instead of you having to do that yourself, it's like, oh, I got all these IOCs, but I want to look at a piece of malware. I want to see what my, I want to find my own IOCs. Then you got to spin up 
you know, a box to turn around to detonate the malware and dig through it all, reverse engineer it. They, they pay analysts to do so. Um, one of them gave a, one of their senior analysts gave a presentation at ThoughtCon a couple of years ago in a training class on how their program works, and that's great, but to pay his salary and 10 other guys, they're really expensive programs. So I think some of it's out there. I haven't seen a lot of it so far, especially on the user behavior side of things. Um, hopefully everyone's looking at user behavior analysis and you know endpoint detection and monitoring tools are really huge right now. You need to have one. Uh, everything's going on in memory and everything's going on at the endpoint uh, and we're not seeing a lot of stuff network based anymore and so it's definitely there and I think that's probably in the future, that's what we're gonna see, but definitely not in the free feeds and even a lot of the stuff out there that vendors are providing. As I said, 99% of it is IOCs with no date attached, no information to them, where they came from, that type of thing. So no, at this point, I haven't seen a lot out there that's anywhere close to not only tell me where it came from, but why and what the actual behavior was and if we can stop a user, if we can stop this attacker from doing it behavior-wise. Anybody else? Yeah, uh, like I said, there's options out there. Uh, we specified on Splunk just because they're a great vendor and they do it a really good job. Uh, they are expensive in data logging. So if you're going for an actual vendor, you need to look at the data ingest. You are paying essentially for the data you process during per day. And so you need to look at those levels and figure out if that's actually functional out there. I have not looked at it. I'm not on the engineering side of our team, so I haven't really looked at. I wasn't part of the, the proof of concept to test several of them. So the main one I've seen so far is Splunk and then some of the, the um, open source ones I've poked around at. But uh, a huge part would be if you've got your logging in, in place in the first place, are you putting it into one tool and then passing it on to Splunk? Are you able to get it actually, are you able to actually get all those logs off? So it's really that inter, interoperability and functionality. If based on what systems you're running, you're actually able to get the logs into something that'll do that inspection. And that's the biggest part for me is just, just an actual tool that, that works <laughs> that actually functions. Uh, Splunk is the big one I've used just because we have it at work. So it's the only one I've really played with that's in the big vendor space. I, I can't really tell you beyond that, but I can tell you what they do is great. And anything that's like that, that will actually ingest all the logs, break them down into uh, you know a, a model of tags. So that you've actually got tag data. So you can see, you know, you can search across source, source IPs, URLs, that type of thing. Any of the tools that are doing that is just a huge benefit because then you don't have to go out and you know attempt to, especially from if nothing else from the incident response perspective, to turn around and have a tool where I can just feel like I can go to one tool and turn around and do searches and see what happened across the environment. And I don't have to turn around and say, try and figure out which servers got impacted or which, you know, route, what routing information I got to go track down, that type of thing. So just some type of central logging is a huge move forward from the analyst perspective, just from, just from a time frame perspective and feeling like you can do any type of incident response at all. Thank you. Yep. Anybody else? <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, Windows, whether you're talking about uh, Windows endpoints or Windows servers, are horrible. So if anyone's ever tried to pull off an event log from a server, it stinks. And so that is another benefit of Splunk. Uh, Splunk actually has a tool called the Universal Forwarder. It's an agent that you install just like another endpoint agent that will actually forward those logs in a readable format. That's a huge benefit of Splunk. I don't know which other tools do that. It's been a huge boon for us to get that data because that's, as we're testing these pieces and these detection pieces, all the endpoint logs is what we're moving to next. We, we have a third party vendor that does user behavior analysis, but we want to be able to verify that on our own by pulling all the Windows event logs from the endpoints and eventually from the servers as well. And without a, without a tool that's got a universal forwarder, if you try and pull Windows logs, I don't know who all's done this, but if you try and pull Windows logs off one box and read them on another, it's just not designed to do that. Your only other option is for Microsoft to set up a essential centralized logging database of event logs, forward them all to that, and then use that box, which you could then turn around and feed into your logging format. But if you've got a tool that's got an agent that'll turn around and forward that into something like a Splunk, you've then got Windows event logs on top of it. It's actually searchable and broken out for you in a format you can actually read because not only that, but Windows event logs are horrible just in general and trying to read through them all, especially in, in any type of incident response and trying to figure out, because you'll have 4,000 events at the same time and two of them you care about and trying to find that on a machine 
if it's not forwarded as horrible. Anybody else? All right. That's it for me. Thank you very much.